Good morning. We welcome you this morning to Calvary Baptist Church in Larkspur, California. This is our morning worship service, and we're so thankful that you could join us as we worship the Lord. This morning, we invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to begin looking at uh, verses 9 through 12. And so uh, we've read some of this, but uh, let me go over it with you again. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, that is the Messiah, which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them, that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angel desire to look into. Peter brings the first part of this uh, section of this uh, first chapter uh, with uh, this word, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of of your souls. The great message of the Word of God is salvation. It is messages throughout the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament believers were saved the same way that you and I are saved. They were saved by faith. It was God's grace. They're not saved by works, they were saved by faith. Now verses 10 through 12, uh, Peter described the greatness of our salvation, but kind of in an unusual way. Most of the time when we are studying the scriptures and we're looking at our salvation, we see it from our point of view. Uh, what, what is God doing for us? But it's interesting in this one, he, he actually takes it from the perspective of the Old Testament prophets. I don't know if maybe at times you have, as you've been reading the scriptures, you're maybe in the New Testament, and um, you will, uh, maybe the, the, when Jesus was talking to the uh, disciples on the way to Emmaus, and uh, if you remember, uh, he took him all the way through different portions of the Old Testament, showing him what was supposed to take place. Uh, and sometimes when we're in the New Testament, we say, well, I've read the Old Testament, and I don't see all these things. I don't always see uh, the salvation and those things. And yet, it is there. And so what Peter is doing is, he's taking us back to the prophets, and he's telling us here how that they were looking to understand this great salvation. And he mentions here the fact that um, the prophets uh, were looking for it, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, the New Testament apostles, and the angels. All of those he's going to cover in these verses. The prophets studied the Holy Spirit inspired, the apostles preached it, and the angels long to understand it. Remember, the angels are not saved. They were created the way they were. Those who fell, they were lost. There is no salvation. So they long to look in that. And we will see that, Lord willing, maybe next week. Uh, but this morning really want us to look at just uh, verse 10 and half of verse 11. Heavenly Father, I thank you that uh, it's just amazing when we think of 
this very simple um, fisherman who you called from his life of, on the lake, casting his net day after day, a simple life, uh, difficult, a great deal of labor, uh, many times hardships and disappointments. But you took this man and others like him and transformed them. You saved their souls. You taught them. You uh, let them be around you for two and a half, three years and, and to learn from you. You gave them the Holy Spirit as you give to us. And it's so amazing, Lord, to to be able to open this portion of Scripture and hear what you have done through this man and, and as you've given him your word that we receive. And I pray, Lord, that uh, as, we, as we continue uh, in this precious book, uh, that you will bless the truths to our hearts. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, that um, you use him Thank you, Lord, that you bless us with your truth. Oh, Lord, that we would know more and more about your salvation, that we would better understand exactly what thou hast done in and for us. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless thy word this morning to our hearts. In Christ's wonderful and precious name, amen. Now, Peter begins this section with the prophet's study. Uh, verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired uh, and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. The prophets studied their own prophecies, not just the ones they wrote, like Haggai didn't just study Haggai, but they, 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 they studied the other prophets. Uh, they studied the rest of the Old Testament. Uh, these were godly men who were specially called to God. The Bible says that they were holy men of old, uh, were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so here these men are, and they weren't just bringing these prophecies, these messages to Israel, but they were taking the time to study these books and to study these prophecies and to see. What did they want to see? The greatest thing they wanted to see was God's salvation. That's what they concentrated on more than anything else. Now, they had a message, each one of them, for Israel. They also had prophecy, as we think of prophecy, the foretelling of the future. And we know as we read Daniel and we read Ezekiel and we read many of these others and we, we see those pictures and we see those things and, and we, we're very excited about them because it tells us of the future. But their focus was on salvation. That's what Peter is telling us here. God's wonderful grace to sinners is the greatest theme in the universe. It is the greatest theme in the history of the world. Just yesterday and today, I, I was thinking so much of the, about the fact that, especially I think in the last couple of years, there has been a real worldwide push, and it's very easy for Satan to get this push going because of all the things we have, but a push to focus on man, to focus on man's problems, to focus on man's uh, inequities and, and all these other things. And they all sound good. And, and we sit there and go, oh, yes, there's this need and this need and this need. But what is he doing? He's taking our eyes off of God, number one, and he is taking our eyes off of man's greatest need, and that is salvation. Because if we would solve all of the problems in the world, and yet everybody was left lost, we've done nothing. What, is it, what did Jesus say? If a man should gain the whole world 
and lose his soul. And that is what Satan is doing. He is distracting the world with all these other things so that man will lose his very soul. Because Satan is promising them everything else. And so the greatest thing is that God in His grace has provided salvation for everyone. It is available to everyone. And the Old Testament prophets had a real passion to understand it. Now, don't misunderstand. They were saved by grace. They were saved by faith. They believed God. There was no question about that. But their understanding of, of salvation was limited because they lived before Jesus Christ came, before he died, before he rose again from the dead. And so they, there was that limit there. But within their prophecies, within their teaching that God himself gave them was the answers. And so they diligently searched it out. And in addition to that, they long uh, to, to understand God's plan uh, to extend salvation beyond Israel. Uh, there are those verses that show them that, listen, salvation is not just for uh, you, but it is for the whole world. Remember, the Bible clearly tells God told Abraham that he was going to be a blessing to who? Not just to Israel, not just to his lineage, but to, to all nations. And we have seen that. They didn't totally understand that, but they knew it was there. And that's what they wanted to understand. And so they intently studied, number one, the grace, the saving grace of God that was come to sinners through him. Verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Think of what he's saying here. Pay attention to what he's saying. Let's back, kind of go backwards. He is saying to those he's writing to that this salvation has come to you. And this salvation, this grace, is what the prophets were diligently studying and searching to better understand. Salvation concerns primarily the divine act of saving sinners. Let me give you that again. Salvation concerns primarily the divine act of saving sinners. Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, he said, uh, the Son of Man did not come to serve but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In other words, he came to save us. He also said in John chapter 12, I have come as a light into the world, that whosoever believes in me shall not abide in darkness. And then he goes on in another verse and he says, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus very clearly said, my mission, my message was to save people. Turn with me to Hebrews in chapter 9. Uh, you're very close to it. Just back up a few pages there. When you get to Hebrews 9, let's go down to verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands. That is, he's not talking about the temple here on earth, but the one in heaven. All right? Which are the figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. When Jesus went right back to heaven, he went there to do what? To appear there before God for us. Not yet that he should offer himself often. In other words, he didn't come to die over and over and over and over and over. 
as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. The, holy, the priest had to go in. They had to keep on making that sacrifice. For then must he have often suffered the, since the foundation of the world. In other words, if he did it the way the priest did, he would have had to be sacrificed. He would have had to be crucified from the very beginning, from Adam and Eve and on and on and on and on and on and on. But now, once... In the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. When he died on the cross, what did he do with your sin? What did he do with my sin? What did he do with it? He put it away. It's gone. And as it is appointed on a man once to die... But after this, a judgment. There's no second chance afterwards. <clears throat> People think, oh, well, when I die and if I, if, if I made a mistake, I get to correct it. It's too late. He said, it is appointed on, on man wants to die. Every one of us will die. Unless the Lord comes back and takes us, we will all die. What happens right after? Judgment. So Christ was offered to bear the sins of many. I'm sorry, let me go back and read that again. I didn't read it right. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. God's grace encompasses the entire motive of God's saving work. It's God's grace. That's why his salvation is what it is. Paul wrote, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man, that's Adam, offenses many die. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of God, one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Because of Adam and his sin, we all die. But greater than that is because of Christ's death on the cross and God's salvation through grace, we may live. And not only live now, but live for eternity. Ephesians in chapter 2, familiar to, I think, most of us, verses we probably quote often. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, who? Christ, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, but not of yourselves. It is the gift, by the way, the free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. We're saved by grace through faith, but once we're saved, we are saved to do good works. We're not saved by the good works. We are saved to do the good works. And then Second uh, Thessalonians in chapter 1. Second Thessalonians 1. Verses 11 and 12. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord 
Jesus Christ. Notice God's grace. And so the prophets sought to understand God's grace and mercy in Christ. His forgiveness, God's goodness, God's unmerited favor, God blessing that is lavished on undeserving sinners. That is what grace is. God doing for us what we do not deserve. God's grace speaks of an unearned favor and blessing toward us. God's grace was exhibited, by the way, in the Old Testament in many different ways. Um, for instance, uh, we're told in uh, Genesis, Joseph said to his brother, uh, Benjamin, God be gracious to you, my son. He understood that God was a gracious God, and he prayed that God would be gracious to him. Uh, in, in Exodus, uh, God uh, told the Jewish people through Moses, I will hear him for I am a gracious God. Right there, speaking to Israel, speaking to the people. I want you to know, he said, I am a gracious God. He came to save them. By the way, remember that God showed grace to Noah. Noah was in this wicked generation. They were so evil and wicked. And yet the Bible tells us Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Not because of something in Noah, but because something in God, that was his grace. Grace found Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees. He was a pagan. He was an unsaved man. He didn't know God. We don't know what he worshipped. We don't even know if he worshipped. But God's grace found him and directed him to a land. But more than just a land but he directed him to himself. He brought him by grace to himself. And the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It's God's grace that sent a kinsman redeemer to rescue Israel from the Egyptians. God sent Moses, one of their own. Moses who had to spend 80 years preparing for his job. Imagine that. I think of my grandson as he's, you know, about to graduate next year and probably looking at it and said, boy, this is four arduous, laboring years. Imagine 80 years. Imagine 40 of those years weren't very good. The next 40 years were pretty tough. They were on the backside of the desert, all so he could do the job. But it was God's grace. It was God's grace who took this man, who took this man, by the way, who was a murderer. A man who had been trained in all of the evil of, of, of the religion, of the thinking, and the, and the wisdom of, of Egypt. And by his grace, he called him to come and lead the people. And then they remember Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. She was not a Jewish lady. And yet it was God's grace that not only saved her, but put her in line, the royal line, the line of Christ itself. That's God's grace. That's what God does. And that's one of the things, by the way, if the Jewish people had really paid attention to it, they'd have to say, wait a minute. That was a Moabite. That wasn't one of us. And yet God grafted her in. God showed grace to Nineveh. Uh, Wednesday night, a few Wednesdays ago, we looked at uh, Jonah. Now listen to what Jonah said. After Jonah had, you remember he ran away from God and then God brought him back and then he finally went to the city and he preached and, and they repented. And Jonah was having a hard day because they were his enemy. And this is what he said to God. 
He says, O Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are gracious. I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. Think of that. Think of all the way back there to Noah. You know where he learned that lesson, don't you? Probably in the belly of the fish. His theology really improved in that time. So don't get so upset when you're going through the belly of the fish. When you're going through dark times. And I bet you it was dark in there. But he learned that God was gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Now, he knew that ahead of time. That's why he ran away. He says that. He said, I knew what you were like. But I think he learned it so much greater when he went through all of that. You know, it's kind of like he knew it intellectually. Isn't that the way we're sometimes? We know it intellectually. We hear something. We read something. We know it. Okay, I got it. But it hasn't got any further from here because it's got to get here. I think that that's what happened to Noah. He ran away from God because he knew that God would show Israel's enemy mercy and grace. And then take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. See, in Isaiah, God very clearly makes it known that he would show his grace to all nations. To all nations. To all people. Now, who was the word of God given to? It was given to Israel, right? And they were to take the word and share it with everybody else, but they... They kept it for themselves. They hoarded it. And you know, after a while, it meant nothing to them, sad to say. But look at what he said, verse, verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. And nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. He's speaking of us. He is speaking of all peoples throughout the world who were not Jewish. Everyone. This was God's invitation to the nations of the world, to the people of the world, to partake of his salvation. And so, as, as Peter says here, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. Now remember, 
The name Christ means the Messiah. So what he is saying here in verse 11 is, they also were diligently wanting to know more about the Messiah. Many things about the Messiah we find in the Old Testament. And I want you to write these two down, and I'd like you to, this afternoon, take a little time and read these two portions. Number one, read Psalm 22. Psalm 22 speaks about Christ's crucifixion. And then write down Isaiah 53. Because Isaiah 53 speaks of Christ's suffering. You put those two together. What an incredible picture it is. Uh, it's almost a picture that at times might bring tears to your eyes if you, just, if you just think about and you meditate upon just what Jesus Christ went through. Second of all, not only that he would suffer, but that he would triumph. David wrote in Psalm 16, he says, Thou wilt not abandon my soul to Sheol, neither wilt thou allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. Now you might say the first part of that verse, well that could be talking about David himself. He's saying, you know, you're not going to allow that to happen to me. But the second part doesn't have to do with him at all. He's not the Holy One. He's speaking of the Messiah. He's speaking of him and saying, listen, this is the promise. This is the, I'm sure he probably didn't understand what he's saying, but he's saying that this is the promise from the Father that you will not abandon my soul in death. And neither will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Why? Because he was going to raise him from the dead. David also wrote that the Lord said, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. He goes on and he says, Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations of thine inheritance, and the ends of the earth as thy possessions. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Isaiah wrote, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and the Messiah would bring salvation. There's where Israel really lost it. They were looking at a Messiah who would deliver them from their enemies. They didn't think sin was their enemy. They said, we're, we're children of Abraham. You know, even today, there are people who, who think because of their lineage, they're okay. I don't know how many people have told me over the years, but my mother went to church. Or, or somebody told me the other day, my grandfather was a preacher. So, what difference does that make? And that's, that's people's mentality. I'm okay. And that was Israel's mentality. And, and you notice through the gospel all the way through there that they're not looking for Jesus to come and save them from their sin. They're looking for Jesus to, re, to, to get rid of the Romans. And I find it interesting that when he doesn't fulfill their vision, their dream, they turn him over to the Romans. Isn't that interesting? You remember when Jesus, in his ministry, he had been traveling around, and he didn't go often to his hometown of Nazareth. But when he came there one day, he went, as his practice was, he went to the Sabbath, on the Sabbath to the synagogue. And he stood up to read. That's the way it was. Uh, they recognized him as a teacher. 
They recognized him as uh, some kind of a spiritual leader. And so when he stood up, then one of the priests or, took the scroll and brought it to him. And the scroll that he brought to him that day was Isaiah. And Jesus unrolled that scroll until he got to what we call today chapter 61. They didn't have any chapters. And this is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. And then we are told that he closed the scroll. And in Luke chapter 4, Jesus said this, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You see, the prophets have been looking for the Messiah. What would to be the Messiah like? What would this, the Messiah do? Now, the apostles quoted from the Old Testament. And I think one of the best examples is found in Romans and Paul's writing there to the Romans. So turn with me to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. In some of your Bibles, you will actually see uh, <clears throat> in your margin or at the end of a verse, some of these references I'm going to give you. But Romans chapter 9. Notice verse 25 and 26. As he says also in Osi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Hosea chapter 1. Verse 39, or 33. As it is written, as it is written where? In the Old Testament. As it is written because they sought it not by, I'm sorry. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. That's Jesus Christ. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Isaiah 28. Chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Saved. Joel chapter 2 and verse 32. Verse 20 and 21. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not for me. But to Israel he saith, all day long I am stretched forth my hands unto disobedient and gainsay people. Isaiah 65. Chapter 15 and verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Psalm 18. And then in verse 10, he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 32. And again he says, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. Rejoice, Gentiles rejoicing with Israel. And then verse 12. And again Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, 
And he shall raise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Isaiah chapter 11. And finally, verse 21 here in chapter 15 of Romans, But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Isaiah chapter 52. Paul and the other apostles clearly indicated that the Old Testament prophecies were about the Messiah and that that Messiah was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was that promised Messiah. There are some, I believe, over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ fulfilled. There are probably others that we do not know yet because he is still coming back. And I believe those will be fulfilled then. And so there's many that we haven't even seen yet or we're not really aware of yet. Some we are and others we may not be. But imagine that, 300 prophecies, exact ones, all speak of this one, the promised Messiah, it's all fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Peter will say in verse 10, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come on to you. And that not only apply to Peter's audience, but it applies to all of us. That's God's message to every single one of us. That's not just the message that he has for us here, but it is his message to all who are out there. I have sent my Savior. I have sent the Almighty One. I have sent the Anointed One. I have sent the Messiah. I have sent Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. That is God's message to all of them. To any here or to any who might be listening, God has a plan. God has a way of salvation. And the first thing that God wants us to do is understand and realize that he does love us and that he wants us to have eternal life. He wants us to have our sins for forgiven. That's why he said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. But the second thing he wants us to realize is that we are sinners and that we are separated from God because of our sin. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. We have all fall short of the glory of God. Uh, the Bible also says righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. In other words, sin cannot come into his presence. Isaiah said in 59, he said, but your iniquities have separated you between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. And the third step is to realize that only in Jesus Christ can forgiveness of sins and salvation be ours. We are not saved through baptism. We are not saved through church membership. We are not saved through any of those things, but only through Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. We cannot come into God's presence except through Jesus Christ. There is no other mediator. There is no other one. The other day I was watching a documentary uh, and beautiful, beautiful country, uh, beautiful places, and 
They took us to this town, and I thought this was really interesting because this is a very secular uh, program. And they said, this church is so important to these people because this is where they worship Mary. They often said, no, we don't worship Mary. But the world, the world knows better. Jesus is the only mediator. The Bible says, but God commendeth or demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now you say, well, I, I know all these things. I've heard these things. In fact, I, I believe these things. But it's not enough to just believe in our heads. We must act upon that belief. We must act upon those truths. We must put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself said, repent and believe. And the fourth thing is, we have to receive him personally as our Lord and Savior. The Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he the power or the right to become the children of God. We must ask to receive him and his gift of eternal salvation. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I will open the door and come into him. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, let me just say to you very clearly, Jesus is standing outside of your life he is knocking on the door of your heart and he wants to come in. But you must open the door and allow him to come in. He will not force himself in on you. Will you open the door to Christ? Will you put your faith and trust in him and him alone as your Lord and Savior? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're not left in the dark to know how we can come to know Christ as our Savior. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that even in the Old Testament, the prophets diligently, studiously searched the Word of God so that they might see thy saving grace and might understand thy salvation. And then to understand and to know of this Messiah, this promised one that you would send to save their sins, to save their souls. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that nothing has changed, that Jesus Christ has come, Jesus Christ has died on the cross, Jesus Christ has rose bodily from the grave, and now, and now he sits at thy right hand and the invitation is still the same. Come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. O oh Lord, we pray for those who know not Christ. May they this day turn to Jesus and find everlasting life in them. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that those of us who know the Lord, that we can rejoice in this so great salvation. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.